welcome all to this greatly anticipated event on cooling in cities. Uh, I'm Andy Deacon, Acting Managing Director of the Global Covenant of Mayor's Secretariat team and joining you remotely from Brussels. Uh, the Global Covenant were one of the supporters of the Sustainable Cooling Handbook for Cities that you'll hear much more about during the course of this quickfire session and it links very closely to our work on cities with mission innovation and our ongoing Innovate for Cities initiative. But it's great to also have colleagues from other supporting organizations uh, from UNEP, the Cool Coalition, the Clean Cooling Collaborative, from Mission Innovation and RMI, as well as a distinguished panel joining today. Uh, as the handbook makes clear, the world's cities are heating up at twice the global average rate due to rapid urbanization and the urban heat island effect with potentially catastrophic consequences for uh, health and other aspects uh, of life in the world's very many cities. The handbook is designed to be action oriented and designed to practically help uh, cities prioritize cooling actions based on their local context and to help them build resilience. Uh, I should give special thanks also at the beginning to the team from RMI, to Ian Campbell, uh, to Snea Sashar, uh, Julia Meisel and Richard Nivuti uh, for all of their diligent work to pull the handbook uh, together. The Global Covenant is looking forward to continuing to support its uptake and adoption and implementation of findings and recommendations through our ongoing work. We will be sharing the handbook with our now more than 11,000 cities and with our uh, now 14 uh, regional and national covenants spanning the globe. As we continue to advance also with mission innovation, we will be looking to cities to implement approaches that are outlined in the handbook and to sharing and supporting best practice in sustainable urban cooling approaches uh, through the climate adaptation pillar of our work. I strongly encourage you to take a look, to engage with this uh, exciting and growing coalition of partners and partner organizations that are active and interested in, in urban cooling, and most importantly, to take action on the basis of the findings and recommendations that you'll hear much more about um, during the course of the session. So with those introductory remarks, uh, I'll hand you over to uh, Sophie, who's in the room, um, and will moderate the rest of the session. Um, thank you very much for the chance to say a, a few words, and I look forward to hearing from our panel. Great. Thank you, Andy. Um, thank you to all of the panelists for being here today and all attendees uh, for joining this um, really fascinating session. I'll start the, the discussion with a question for you, um, Jules. Um, um, given that um, RMI led the development of the Sustainable um, Urban Cooling Handbook, can you tell us a bit about why this is important and, um, and, and how this, this handbook came about? With pleasure, Sophie, and delighted to be here today. Can you hear me? Yes, with pleasure and delighted to be here today. Um, we are facing a planetary emergency. That's why we're all here together in Glasgow. But global warming becomes even more of an issue in cities where, as a result of the urban heat effect, the temperature rise may well be twice as high than in the surrounding countryside. And the people who are going to be most hit by the impact of urban heat is the vulnerable poor in uh, cities. It is the people who live without many trees or parks around them, who live near streets and asphalt, even near uh, inner city industrialization. They're going to face the impacts of uh, this urban heat issue more than anyone. So as one of the critical elements of adaptation, cities will have to learn how to cool, how to cool the city and the buildings. And when um, several years ago, uh, a group of us came together to design a handbook of what cities can do, we felt quite excited about it because we see very significant steps that cities can take to address uh, the urban heat impact and drive better cooling. 
Uh, we'll, we'll get to the details of that in, in the course of the panel, I know. But there is one more thing that, that I'd like to say. And that is this effort on cooling is one example of something that is very dear to us at RMI. And that is for organizations to radically collaborate in creating solutions. Governments, mission innovation, but also the civil society organizations, and now mayors who are going to implement the findings. We can only do this if we do it together. So that is the, the story behind the handbook. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jules, uh, um, for the great um, starting notes, and I'm uh, really excited to see this handbook. Um, but now, why don't we listen a bit more from you, Mira Akisori, um, who can tell us about Freetown, um, being the first city who's appointed the first Afri um, African city, sorry, to appoint the first um, chief heat officer. And it would be great to hear um, how important that is for your city and, and what Freetown is doing to tackle extreme heat. Thanks very much. Um, so interesting that you pointed out the absolute need for collaboration and you mentioned the cities. And what we've been really pleased to be a part of working with the Atlanta Council at the Asht, Asht Rockefeller Foundation, Adrian Asht Rockefeller, it's a mouthful, <laughs> foundation. We have just had um, the first set of mayors sign up to be city champions for heat action. And what does that mean? We're working individually and yet collectively. Yesterday I was with the mayor of Athens, mayor of Miami, Dade County, um, and the mayor of Seville and myself have all, for the first time ever, in our different con counties and con countries and continents in some instances, um, appointed chief heat officers. This is telling us that we are being really practical about addressing extreme heat. We're making sure that we have a focal person, in my case, whose vo vo um, focus will be on collecting data. We know extreme heat is a problem. And let me just step back a second and, and make another observation. The, the handbook um, and the conversations um, talk about extreme heat in the context of urbanization. But one of the things that we've got to be very clear about is how that looks very different city to city. What will be extreme heat conditions in Athens are going to be totally different from Freetown. Yet there are learnings, there's, there are there things that we can take from one another. And what we're doing in Freetown um, is to start this, we're sort of moving, we, were, we started off with an, with an, act, an intervention Freetown, the tree town, planting a million trees. And that's urban, it's planting within the urban setting. So providing cooling from that respect. But that's, that's part of what needs to be a continuous evolution of solutions because this, this extreme heat is a killer of many, many people. Um, and it's not recognized yet as such. So that's one intervention. Housing design is another. Um, and let me give two examples from other cities. Um, in, in Athens, my colleague there, who's one of the chief champions, is introducing fountains um, and seeing temperatures come down by three degrees in the, in the neighborhoods with the, with the fountains. So there are, different, there are different approaches, but they will definitely be rooted in what cities can do, because that's really our role, being right there with the residents. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think, yeah, now it'd be great. So we've heard a bit about uh, practical tools, um, concrete implementation in Freetown. And why don't we now um, uh, talk about Vietnam and um, kind of taking that step back at a, at a national level. Um, so Mr. Tan, please, could you tell us a bit more about um, your recent NDCs, enhanced NDCs, you've included um, cooling and extreme heat. Um, and can you tell us a bit more about what the country is doing to implement those commitments into concrete action? So, as you may know, that uh, Vietnam is a developing country. We just uh, entered the middle income countries uh, recently. So, the urban uh, uh, development in Vietnam is growing very fast, uh, with around 20%. Uh, during the period uh, 2012 until 2018. So uh, that's why the, with the extreme e uh, weather event uh, bring a lot of heat to the country. 
So the requirement for urban cooling is increasing significantly uh, uh, during the last uh, few years, uh, not because of uh, only not because only because of the, the uh, rising uh, temperature, but also because of the, the raising in income of people. So uh, that's why we consider uh, applying a greenhouse gas reduction for heating area in urban cities is very important for NDC of Vietnam. Uh, as you may heard that our NDC we have submitted in uh, 2020 uh, with uh, uh, the target for reduced greenhouse gas and we identified uh, 75 measures uh, of the reduced greenhouse gas for our NDC include the urban cities uh, for reduced greenhouse gas. Uh, yesterday, the day before yesterday, the Prime Minister of Vietnam have announced new uh, target for uh, Vietnam to reduce greenhouse gas to reach a net zero by 2050. So that's why we need more action, stronger action from not only government, but everyone has to be included, uh, and city is very, very important part of us. So that's why we consider contribution of cities is uh, for us is very uh, significant for, for us, and the handbook will help us how to implement urban cooling in the city. Uh, currently, we work with ZZI and then UNEP for a project uh, we we pilot project for implement in three cities and then with the handbook we can help to apply for our uh, areas and then uh, replicate to other cities uh, to, to learn how to apply with, with that uh, handbook. Thank you. Thank you. On that, Sophie? Yeah, of course, please. Go because ahead. first of all, I think we have to recognize the leadership and the courage of Vietnam to put a 2050 net zero target on the table. Thank you. But it is also interesting because you point out in what you explained that the cooling handbook is not just about adapting to higher temperatures, but it is also about mitigating action. So this is one of these clear areas where a more sustainable and more resilient future beautifully intersect. The three critical measures that are listed in the cooling handbook, namely city design, designing your cities to accommodate more green, more water, more space, allows for better adaptation. Building more efficient houses, buildings that are by their nature better resilient in higher temperatures, both is a form of adaptation, but also reduces greenhouse gas emissions. And finally, the third measure in the handbook, deploying really efficient cooling technologies, is of course a very significant mitigation technology. So I think it's really interesting from both of your examples how adaptation and mitigation powerfully come together here. Great, thank you. Um, and I think that's a good segue to the second part of this discussion. It's been wonderful to hear this kind of call for more collaboration and introduction to what um, different countries and cities are doing at different levels. Um, but now um, it'd be great to hear a bit more on the practicalities and sort of recommendations and challenges around, around what cities are doing around um, cooling emissions and, and just extreme heat more broadly. So Jules, um, so you, you've mentioned um, a few kind of uh, points of, of uh, the handbook um, and you've collected I think 80 case studies to develop this this handbook so a great collection of, um, of experiences across the world um, would you be able to, to give a few recommendations for cities specifically um, um, to be able to take comprehensive action and to tackle extreme heat absolutely and why are cities such a important point that immediately relates to the first point. I always say, uh, Madam Mayor, 
that uh, mayors are the people who get stuff done. Absolutely. And in the fight against climate change, we need more people like yourself who get things done. So it starts with leadership. And a mayor, him or herself, can decide to take that leadership role on. But as you already pointed out, appointing somebody who's in charge so that you can hold somebody accountable is a very powerful way of, of making that leadership happen. The second thing that, that cities can do is to get started immediately. So many of these measures are no regrets measures, are low or even no cost measures. Yes, planting trees costs a little bit of money, but it is not a, a fortune. Lot <laughs> costs a lot of money. But but urban design, um, efficient building so design and, and the right building code, there are large no regrets measures that you can take as a mayor. The third thing is to look for the pivotal moment when you can build cooling into your city processes. So what are the moments precisely that as a mayor you can say, okay, now I'm going to do something. You're planning a new development or a major redevelopment. That's the moment that cooling has to be on the agenda. You are introducing or initiating a city planning process. That's the moment when the design has to take cooling into account. Or you're evaluating new infrastructure projects as part of account. Are you looking at heat as one of the parts of that infrastructure? So that is the, the, the third step. And then uh, the final one is to demonstrate action and share the action that you're doing and gain support in your city but also in the broader community because as you guys were already pointing out you're learning from other mayors uh, that of course can also hold true within your own region but it is also something that holds true globally but also as a mayor you want to let your the citizens of your of your town or city know what is happening so demonstrating that action is actually paying off in our minds is critically important wonderful thank right. you so this is where reality and the policy diverge um, everything you've said I couldn't agree with more but what is the challenge in our context and this is not unique to my city it is unusual in Europe, and I'd be curious to know what the situation is in Vietnam, but in my country, we have a local government act that devolves the power to plan the city, to issue building permits, to do the zoning. As you would expect, those powers are devolved to the city. In reality, they are held firmly by the central government, by the Ministry of Lands, with devastating impacts on development, as in there isn't any, um, because it's impossible for that sort of power to be centralized and to be delivered effectively. So everything you've said it holds true when the mayor can actually perform those functions. It falls apart when that doesn't happen. And then there's the second challenge. We are planting a million trees. It costs us almost $3 million. That not, might not sound like a lot of money to you, but it's a lot of money to me. Thankfully, we're halfway there. We've got 550,000 in the ground, and we've got a line of sight to the remaining money for the 450,000, which will be planted next rainy season. So that's excellent. But I think what I'm wanting to say is that the handbook is terrific, and all that it says should be done makes perfect sense. The reality now that we've got to come to terms with are what are the obstacles and challenges that stand in the way of this being delivered. Because as we all know, in this decade, everybody has to put hands on deck. All, all interventions from mitigation to adaptation, cooling everything that can be done to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions, to save lives from extreme heat, because we know the temperatures are continuing to rise. Someone very uh, said something very sort of disturbing to me two days ago. They said, think about it for a minute. This year is probably the coolest year you'll ever experience in your life. Next year is going to be hotter, and the year after that, hotter still. So how do we collectively how does the UN organization, how do forums like this put pressure to bear 
on national governments that retain powers that work against very practical interventions that could save lives because planning is fundamental to being able to address a lot of or to be able to deliver on a lot of climate related adaptation as well as some mitigation measures i'll throw that to you yeah well madam mayor let me be very clear it is very easy to lead a civil society organization and write a handbook it is a much more complex job to be the mayor of a city the mayor of a city that uh, operates in a that, that is based in a developing country and that by its geographical location is at the forefront of urban heat right so all respect for your experience i don't have a ready answer <laughs> for for the challenges that your political system um, uh, puts on on your fulfillment of the job i do think that again that radical collaboration that we talked about earlier is a powerful tool because if other mayors in your country in your region provide the same feedback to central government that might be a tool by which we can make uh, some of this happen but the flip side is yes if particularly if it comes to money if money becomes available to developing countries all around the world to implement these measures then the donors the investors need to make sure that that money gets to people like you who can get on with the job thank you very much for sharing the experience and then uh, uh, the, the direction that uh, the countries and then the, the cities should go in the case of vietnam we also put the requirement for reduced greenhouse gas reduction into the law of Vietnam. So that the NDC of Vietnam is not only the commitment in, uh, to UNFCCC, but it reflected in the law of Vietnam that have been adopted by the National Assembly in last November 2020. And we make from 2020 and until now, we translate the requirement in the law into degree of the government request on major emitters in Vietnam have to reduce greenhouse gas. We put the target for each of them. And the city as well, it is very important. So the city, when we do the NDC, we go from uh, bottom up, everyone can contribute. Then we put the law, the target of the nation, and put it in law, and then the, now it's the time to, to implement. So city is very important one to achieve that target for that city or sector. So the role of the city have to plan, uh, have to call the investor based on the requirement of, it, uh, of, of the government, and then to achieve the target for greenhouse gas reduction. That is the way we, we do. With new commitment from Vietnam to reduce our greenhouse up to uh, zero, net zero by 2050, we have to do more. So everything has to be count for contribution. And to, to achieve that, we need investor. We need support from developed country, from investor all over the world go to the low carbon development of Vietnam, come to Vietnam, it's very welcome to, 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 to invest in Vietnam. Great, thank you, thank you very much. This was a really fascinating discussion. I think um, a lot to take on and um, really excited to, to read about the handbook, um, hear more about case studies and see the progress of uh, Freetown and, and Vietnam m moving forward um, in terms of extreme heat and, and cooling. Um, I can see, do you want no, to make like another? There's a hand from the audience. Oh, yes. Um. The question is, technology is your policy, right? What are you doing to make sure that you are implementing the local workforce? Those are the... So my question is in relation to policies that you all are implementing. What are you doing to make sure that the people at the bottom of the, of the triangle, of, in terms of economic, uh, uh, participation are actually engaging because if you start if we start to think about Maslow's hierarchy hierarchy of needs right and we tie directly the need of people to the policies of one so I'm from the I'm from you from the US 
And in Minnesota, the city of Minneapolis implemented a 100% renewable energy go. What we've done is we've pushed, me personally, my business, we've pushed to make sure that that workforce actually, ha that, that all of that work happens with equity. Making sure that there are black and brown people that, that actively participate, make income off of these jobs. Not just saying, oh, we're going to do this policy, but then also creating uh, vertical ladders that will make sure that young people, because the younger people that are not here at this conference are the workforce of the future. We can tie no different than Donald Trump did. What he talked about was bringing coal back. If we can utilize the green economy as a way to give people career opportunities, training, and pathways, we can make sure. So my question is, what are you all doing to make that happen? OK. So let, let me answer you first uh, from the case of uh, our uh, how to bring everyone participate in the uh, action that uh, put in the nation level. That is the policy of our country. We put the climate change response is not only responsibilities of the government, the responsibilities of everyone. So that's why we create, the, we develop and approve the law before we develop and then the approve the law, the input from all for that uh, policy, uh, everyone be heard from uh, contribution for, for the law and after the law is approved. So responsibilities of everyone to implement. So that's, that is the case that why we put the commitment of Vietnam into the law. I think that not many developing countries do in such kind of thing. But we do, we think that it is the right way to do. Without the regulation, without the law, without the policy approved, we cannot force people to contribute for climate change, both mitigation and adaptation. Right. Thanks. Um, and on a practical level, with um, the example of Freetown, the tree town, um, that's created over a thousand jobs. Um, and that's jobs that you're targeting young people. So from the seedlings in the nurseries, that's huge. To be able to have, well, to have to, um, to have nursery providers supply a million trees. That's 11, we're working with 11 nurseries um, and they, they have themselves had to increase their own staff. So that's something that's really tangible. Moving beyond that, we have the concept of tree stewards. So anybody in the city can be a tree steward. Anybody can plant a tree. But we digitally track every tree. Each tree has a unique identifier. There's a tree tracker app, and there's 600 young people whose job it is to track and monitor. They get paid every month with mobile money transfers based on the growth of those trees. And similarly with our sanitation work that we're doing, as part of our mitigation from, from the perspective of methane, although it's still nothing compared to what farming produces, we're still targeting wherever we, are, wherever we have the emissions. Because emissions are not just about it's going to hit the ozone, and it, well, yes, absolutely, that's an issue, but it's also about quality of life because of the air pollution. So we are targeting that, and we've created almost 2,000 jobs now um, with our sanitation micro-enterprises. So the whole, we've got a real commitment to jobs um, as part of the green, our green recovery, or our green growth, not really recovery. Great, thank you. Th thank you so much. Thank you for your question and uh, for this great discussion. I think we can now close the session. We're running out of time, so I, I'll let um, John here to, to give some closing remarks, um, who's f coming from uh, the UK Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Thank you, John. Oh. This should be on. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, uh, this okay. Hello. Hear. Right. Apologies for that. Um, yeah. So, um, thanks, Sophie. Um, you know, to start with, I just really want to say a huge thank you to all three of the panelists, to um, to Mayor Aki Saya, to Jules, and to Tan. That was really fascinating. And I'm going to take away the free town to tree town. I thought that was absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Um, what we've heard really here is you know, the impact of heat effects, um, the need for action, and Tan really putting that into sort of into context of joining the two. 
together, which I thought was fascinated. Now, within Mission Innovation, we've been involved in um, the the Sustainable Cooling Handbook, really from its inception, and you know we're absolutely delighted to see sort of the outcome of um, this document actually being produced. But you know that's really only a start, and what we'd like to do now, as Mission Innovation moves into its next phase, is to see how we can draw on the um, the sort of feedback from the Sustainable Handbook. And um, you know, as you're implementing things with it within your cities, we'll be very keen to understand where the innovation and the research needs still exist, which we can then sort of trigger and sort of tackle through mission innovation. So I hope that this is not the sort of the end of a relationship, but the start of a, a new relationship and taking that forwards. It's been a really stimulating conversation this morning, and um, just want to thank all three panelists very much indeed for for organising or for taking part. To Andy for for organising it and to, um, to Sophie for making it all happen. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.